Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. We are going to be talking about uh, D11, D13, and D15 deer zones. Uh, we had a lot of registrants for this uh, webinar. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we have four really devoted staff that are going to be presenting tonight, and I'm glad they're on board to help us. We're going to uh, help you get out in the field and hopefully try to increase your potential for success out there deer hunting or bear hunting this year. So uh, if for some reason you have to break from us and you have to leave uh, this webinar, it will be recorded and hopefully up on our YouTube channel tomorrow. Uh, if not tomorrow, early next week. A uh, couple of housekeeping items. Um, please use the question answer function for any questions you expect to be answered. Uh, they get lost in the chat. So the chat is open at this time too, if you have any comments to add, but any questions that you wanna ask and you want responses to, please use the question and answer function. Uh, you have choices for how you view this uh, webinar. Up in the upper right-hand corner, there's a view button. You can choose whichever view that works best for you. Our panelists are gonna be sharing some screen so, uh, off their computer and some images. So if you need to increase the size of that, you can do so in those different views. Uh, really quick, it's six o'clock. Uh, we still have more people coming in. It uh, looks like 180 attendees, and I expect a couple more. I was shooting for about 200. Usually only get half of the registrants that uh, uh, apply. So we're almost there. Um, see questions. There is good some good questions already coming in. And I have forwarded some of the questions to the panel already. So uh, they, they are aware of some of the questions you had, the ones that were presented to me and hopefully they'll incorporate them in their um, presentation. So that being the case, we are at 6.01. I'll give it till 6.02 and I'll introduce my panelists to you and we'll get started with this webinar. I expect it to go a little bit past seven. Um, so if you can't hang around, just please uh, know that it will be recorded and we will try to uh, get that to you as soon as possible. All right, so really quick, uh, I see Ryan moving around there. I'm going to actually introduce Ryan Cordero first. He's the person that actually presented this idea to me. He wanted to present this subject to uh, all you webinar viewers out there who are following us on Advanced Hunter Ed. I myself, actually, I should introduce myself. I never do this. I'm Sean Alagi. I'm the actual uh, coordinator for the Advanced Hunter Ed uh, program. And we, um, I've been doing this for just a little bit over a year now. And unfortunately, with the pandemic, we haven't been able to do the live clinics. And I trust me, I want to get back to them as soon as possible. But we're going to continue this webinar format uh, for as long as you know I'm still around because they have been very effective getting reaching people who can't attend a clinic. So uh, in that case, if you have any topics that you'd like uh, covered, get them to me. I'm very open to uh, re and receptive to trying to do that. So once again, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Ryan Cordero. Ryan, go ahead and tell the audience about yourself. Good evening, folks. Ryan Cordero. I'm a patrol lieutenant with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. My primary area of responsibility is going to be Orange County with portions of East LA County, a little bit of Riverside and San Bernardino County, mainly those areas that fall within the, uh, the, the areas of the, of the Santa Ana Mountains. I've been with the department for 12 years now, and I got to say, I, I pitched this idea because I knew there would be a lot of interest, being that this tag is interchangeable between three zones and over the years, uh, getting a lot of inquiries and seeing the amount of people out hunting. I knew it was a, a, an area that, that people would be interested in uh, because of the, the high density of population that we have, but also because of the challenges uh, that we face in these particular zones. And what I particularly like most about, about my job as a wildlife officer with the department is the interactions with the public that I have out, whether it's in a saltwater fishing environment or in the hills talking with hunters, because we just have such a variety of, of uh, constituents that are 
that are out in the field that we get to talk to and interact with on a daily basis. And that's, I think, what I really appreciate about this. Thank you, Sean. Yep, that is definitely down the line of uh, most of us that are going to be on here. Amelia, Piera, uh, would you go ahead and introduce yourself, please? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amelia Vieira. I am an environmental scientist with CDFW. Uh, my main area of responsibility is Los Angeles County and Orange County. Um, I've been with the department for four years and three years in this position. Something I enjoy about my job is I really enjoy talking to the local communities about wildlife. I like getting out there, talking to people, um, teaching them new things that they didn't know about wildlife. But um, I also love being out in the field. The views are amazing out there, and uh, there's nothing that beats that when that's your job. Great, thanks. And Dustin, Dustin Pierce. Hey, everybody. I'm uh, glad to join you uh, today. My name is Dustin Pierce. I'm an environmental scientist and unit biologist working in Santa Barbara and Ventura counties, uh, kind of in our northern portion of Region 5. And uh, I've been with the department for two years uh, right now, and I would say, you know, really one of the favorite things uh, for me is actually getting to spend a lot of time um, doing some field research actually out in uh, D13, which I'll be discussing later. Uh, really enjoy that. Obviously love uh, getting out there during the hunting season. Uh, we're, um, you know, out there contacting a lot of folks and do enjoy um, a lot of the kind of more social parts of the job. But I uh, definitely appreciate getting out in some of these unique places. All right. Well, we've lost one of our, our fourth panelists. Hopefully he'll come back before his uh, sections do, but luckily he's last. So maybe somebody on the panel can uh, help him out, trying to get back on if, there, if there's an option. But otherwise, you, you know, I like to start off our webinars with a poll and a joke. Uh, each one will be... Uh, uh, very valuable to us to gauge our audience who's with us tonight. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch this poll. And please participate panelists, you can vote too. Uh, first question, I'm gonna read these cause they don't appear on my recordings. How many days will you devote to deer hunt? Well, that wasn't the right one, but I'll go ahead and go with it anyways. <clears throat> How many days will you devote to deer hunting? One to three, five, four to six, more than six days. And the joke, what kind of summer camp would a toilet, a mountain lion, and a cantaloupe go to? A John Cougar melon camp. <laughs> Pretty stupid, but hey, I was looking for appropriate jokes. <clears throat> There's plenty of dirty ones out there, but I can't put those on the air. <clears throat> All right, I'll give it a couple more seconds here. And in the poll in five, four, three, two, one and share my results. So you can see that we have a lot of people on here tonight. Over 60% of you say that you're gonna devote more than six days to deer hunting. Great, uh, it's very ambitious. That's what it might take to go out there and be successful. And 82% uh, of you liked my joke, that was funny. So thanks uh, for that one. Let's see what we can do for the next poll. I'll start where I was supposed to start. And number one question was, have you ever hunted in zones D11, D13, or D15? No is one option. Yes, one to three seasons. Yes, four to six seasons. Yes, more than six seasons. And the joke is, what happens when the smog lifts in Los Angeles? UCLA. <laughs> <laughs> All right, somebody laughed. I'm trying to, I'm try, I tried hard not to pick on you Southern California people. I'm in the Central Valley and it's, it's not quite as bad most of the time. All right, here we go. We're gonna end it in three, two, one. And share my results. So here's what our audience is consisting of tonight. Panel, you can see what we have. There are 38% uh, who've never hunted these zones. Um, 34% that have hunted it one to three seasons, 8% that have hunted it four to six, and 20% that have hunted it more than six seasons. So we have a pretty diversified number there. Uh, I like it. And hopefully for all of you that have not hunted it, this will be your year that you'll get out there and be successful. 
All right, so let me try one more. We have two more questions actually. What zone are you most interested in learning about? D11, D13, D15. Which one are you most interested in learning about? And the joke is, what did the mountain lion say to the bathroom attendant? Out of the way, I'm about to poop my pants. <laughs> Puma. Mm. Puma's another name for the mountain lion. <laughs> Amelia's smiling. That's all that matters. We got some smiles. <laughs> These are corny, I know, they come off the internet, but I'm not creative enough to make them up myself. So here we go, we got the, we're gonna end it in five, four, three, two, one. I appreciate all your guys' input, so thank you. So here's what our audience wants to know. They wanna know about D11. Okay, that's you, Amelia, you got a lot of pressure there tonight. Uh, also D13, okay. Dustin and D15, that's you, uh, Ryan. So a majority, 50% want to learn about D11. Oops, I'm sorry. I wasn't sharing that with you. 86% uh, thought my joke was okay. <clears throat> All right. And one more question. This one's a really corny joke too. But this one is important to, to me. I want to see how many people are interested. Will you purchase a bear tag in case you have a chance to harvest one? Uh, yes or no? And joke is, what do you call a bear with no teeth? A gummy bear. <laughs> that was a bad one, terrible. Okay, we got the joke ending in, I mean, the, the joke, the poll, this is an easy one. Ending in five, four, three, two, one. And end poll and share results. So 59% say you will buy a deer, uh, bear tag. That's good. Um, and 83%. So I'm, I'm drastically falling off on my jokes. So no more, no more jokes for tonight. Panel, you saw the results of our polls. We know what kind of audience we have. We're, I think we're going to do a good job at addressing uh, some of the things that they have going for us. So uh, at this time, I will turn it over to Ryan Cordero. Uh, he will be talking about um, D15 and uh, take it away, Ryan. Okay, how about now? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, everything's good. Okay, excellent. Okay, thanks, Sean. Great jokes, by the way. Those are right up my alley, personally. The poll was very interesting. I, I am not surprised that D11 had the majority of interests and that D15 was in the minority. So on that note, I'm going to try and I have a lot of slides, so I'm gonna try and get through the ones that are just general information that I know some of our other panelists are gonna cover in order to just give you some of the real specific detailed information that I know a lot of you in the D15 are looking for. So without further ado, here's a map that we have of the D15 zone. And this is from our department's website and most of the information that you're gonna see here, and I know from the other panelists as well, is gonna be from our department's uh, website. It's just consolidated in real succinct uh, fashion here. So in a nutshell, what this means to everyone, the relevance of this is that D15, although it's, it's this entire area that I'm circling adjacent to the 14, the 11 over here, 19, 16, it really, what it really means to public hand land hunters in particular is that this area here of the Cleveland National Forest and specifically the Tribuco district of the Cleveland National Forest is going to be the huntable area that we'll be talking about. There are some private land opportunities around here and even a little bit outside of the Cleveland area. This area here that's shaded green and has lines through it is part of the Cleveland National Forest and the Tribuco Ranger District but has a special designation as the San Mateo Wilderness Area which we'll talk about a little bit later and, later and doesn't really impact hunters in particular. Also note here off into the ocean, Santa Catalina Island, that is technically part of the D15 zone. So I'll touch on that here in a minute. 
Okay, like I mentioned before, we're talking about the Tribuco District of the Cleveland National Forest. There's some contact information. I know Sean's gonna put up some links, so we won't stay on this page uh, long at all here. We're dealing with an area with elevation less than 6,000 feet, so it is very hot and dry. Here's some good resources. The two on the far right are probably the best ones I would recommend uh, that you can obtain from the local Forest Service office. The one in the middle is a topographic map, which is great for, for really analyzing uh, uh, terrain. And then the one on the right is a, a big kind of overview map that is still good for, for planning and for uh, traveling purposes as well. So land ownership, like I mentioned before, primarily we're talking about the Tribuco district of the Cleveland. And if you are fortunate enough to have some opportunity to hunt private lands, just remember you do have to have written permission while hunting on those lands. And I would highly suggest, you know, having those maps, GPS, doing your homework prior to going out in the field and even utilizing some of the real popular uh, apps that are on smartphones for helping you to stay in compliance in terms of, oh, you know, being able to know whether you're on private versus public land. Okay, on to Santa Catalina Island. It is part of the D15 zone, but it's very unique in that it is considered a private land management hunt. So PLM is private land management. And that means that Catalina Island enters into an agreement with the Department of Fish and Wildlife in order to have a active hunt program, a recreational hunt program on the island. Uh, this map is a little bit more information that you'll need initially here, but just note, here's Avalon, where most folks are coming in and out of, and any, as of recent years, the island, and by island, I mean the Catalina Island Conservancy, who owns and operates upwards of 70% of this island, and anywhere you can hunt on this island, is requiring hunters to come into Avalon, and there's some logistical challenges with that. In fact, there could be a whole webinar in itself dealing with Catalina Island and how to, how to access it. But I would highly recommend visiting the Lynx webpage uh, to access, uh, to contact the Catalina Island Conservancy directly where they can give you some good information on, if you, on how you would go about hunting. There's two main ways on how to do it. The one, pretty straightforward way is to go through their contracted guide. Uh, Wildlife West is their contractor who has the sole contract for Catalina Island. And uh, contracting and scheduling through them is probably the easiest, most straightforward way to do it logistically. The second option is to go it alone. And as of right now, that logistically is a bit complicated with you having to go into Avalon. Uh, if you're not familiar with Avalon, it's a densely populated, small town and walking through Avalon to get into the hunt areas. You see here the shaded red area with those lines across it. Those are no hunting zones on the island. So you would have to walk from Avalon into the back country um, quite a bit, probably close to five miles before you're even in the hunt zone. And these are steep miles too, by the way, out of Avalon into the back country. Okay, here's just a snapshot from the Catalina Island Conservancy's website about what kind of documents would be required should you want to uh, attempt to, to hunt on Catalina Island. But in a nutshell, what you're gonna need to do is exchange any valid tag in any zone for a PLM tag through the Catalina Island Conservancy. There's a certain, uh, there's a fee that goes with that along with all these other documents that need to be exchanged in order to be eligible to obtain that private land management tag that is very specific to Catalina Island. Okay, obtaining a deer tag. It's an over-the-counter tag. That's all I really need to say on the D15, 11, and 13 tags. How to obtain it. If you're in the system, if you've had a hunting license or a fishing license, you're in the ALBS system, and if you've already completed your hunter ed course, you can obviously buy your hunting license, but also procure your tag online or at a participating re retailer or uh, at a fish and wildlife office. Here's some harvest data reports specific to the D15 zone. And you can see the, the number to focus on is over here in the far right hand corner, the 7%. And that was for 2019, but that doesn't change very much. I can tell you from my experience over the 12 years 
not only working, but as a, as a D1500 myself, um, it's a very difficult hunt for a variety of reasons we'll talk about here in a moment. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward hunt in that it's a four corn buck or better. There's no either sex tag in the D15. It's just, it's just a buck tag is all you get. And I know some of our panels will, will go into detail about what's a legal buck, but basically a branch in the upper two thirds. Here's uh, something I found uh, that I've used in prior presentations, but up here kind of paints the picture pretty well for you. It's gotta have that branch in the upper two thirds. Like I said, we're gonna be talking about this a little bit more later on. So we'll move on from here. Okay, access. So here's where I really wanted to spend some time for those of you interested in the D15. Um, I get a lot of questions from hunters wanting to hunt in the D15 about where to go, where to access uh, some of the areas to go hunt uh, in the D15. And these are some of the, the main trailheads and roads that I identified um, for this presentation that I would recommend for hunters to as a good starting point for them um, if they're interested in hunting in the D15. And I, we can talk in, in a little bit more detail here. So this map, and I'll, I'll try and uh, show you some other, some other uh, views as well, but just to, to kind of orient you, you a little bit here, this is Ortega Highway that I'm cursing along here. This is Lake Elsinore, Riverside County. This is county line going up and down here. This is uh, like city of Lake Elsinore. And then down to the south, if you followed Ortega Highway, this roadway here down south, that would take you to the city of San Juan Capistrano. So Ortega Highway is a great reference point for this map here. And you can see there's some icons here that Forest Service has. Uh, by the way, this is coming from all these maps that I'm gonna show you are coming from that topographic map that I showed you an image of that I highly recommend for anybody hunting in the uh, Cleveland National Forest. Um, South Main Divide Road, you see it listed here. So that is right off of Ortega Highway. And this leads you down quite a ways into the perimeter of the San Mateo Wilderness Area. And everything in that area is wilderness area, which for this area basically means that it's very, very low impact recreation in that there's no mountain bikes allowed no vehicles off-road allowed. So you can only, to access the interior wilderness portions of the San Mateo wilderness, you would have to go either on horse or on foot. And I highly recommend that people spend some time getting away from the vehicles. I think a lot of success will come from you getting off the beaten path and away from the roadways. And there's plenty of trails, particularly in the San Mateo wilderness area, that will get you into some really remote wilderness areas. Some of the challenges with that are gonna be the terrain in that it's very thick, dense, steep terrain. So not a whole lot of open space to, to not a lot of vantage points to glass, uh, so to speak. There are some, you just have to, to get off the beaten path, like I said. Uh, if you go to the north here, off Ortega Highway, so this road where my cursor is following, this loop, so to speak, from Long Canyon Road, Main Divide Road, this, is, uh, this will get you ultimately up to this point here, which is the Main Divide Road that will extend all the way north, essentially to Sierra Peak, which is right at the border of like the city of Corona and the 91 freeway. And although mileage wise, it's not very far, I think we're somewhere in the 25 mile range, um, road miles, it, it's the better part of a day when traveling on that type of terrain in a vehicle. Um, this is the Blue Jay campground uh, here, this icon here, this is a very popular staging area for hunters who are trying to get an early start for hunting in the Santa Ana mountains. It's the only campground that is this accessible into the backcountry areas of the Santa Ana Mountains. So it's a very popular uh, campground for, for hunters. There are some, some areas, I'll tell you every year, like along this loop here where there's a lot of hunting activity, there's a lot of areas that open up. You can see if you, if you know how to read topographic lines, there's some space here that opens up, flattens out a little bit. There've been some recent fire activity 
So those are always good places to look uh, with new, new, uh, new vegetation. And uh, this is this loop, this, this area here has always been a very popular area for hunters as well as off this road here on South Main Divide as well. Let's pull up another map here. Okay, so this one here to give you some orientation, this is Santiago Peak. This is the highest peak in Orange County. Saddleback as it's known. Majesca Peak is over here and Santiago Peak is over here. If you see it from a distance, particularly from the ocean, it's pretty distinct. You'll see the smaller peak Majesca right next to Santiago uh, Peak as well. Saddleback is, is how it's identified together. And then uh, down to the south here, you'll have Tribuco Canyon Road. Here's O'Neill Regional Park, which is another camping. Well, I shouldn't say it's a good camping option because it's managed by Orange County Parks and they do not allow firearms in their parks. So it's probably not gonna be a feasible option for any, any hunters wanting to get a good start into the Santa Ana Mountains. And to be totally honest with you, it's not in a great location. Tribuco Canyon Road, for example, is uh, a very popular off-road uh, that is highly traveled. Uh, Historically, I don't know any successful hunters along this road at all. You can get back here into the Holy Jim Trailhead. You can see this is a, a foot trail, but very dense, very steep, uh, highly vegetated uh, trail. A lot of recreational hikers here. So not, in my experience, uh, an ideal place to, to attempt to hunt for deer. Uh, moving down this way to the west, you can see Majesca here. This is the town of Majesca, which is a, a city within, a, it's technically Silverado is the township here in Orange County. Majesca is part of Silverado, but it, it is its own canyon and a real popular, an easy way to find access into Majesca Canyon is off of Santiago Canyon Road, which it'll be pictured on, a, on another map here as well as some of the other very popular recommended uh, access points are gonna be all off State uh, Highway 18, Santiago Canyon Road, which is just outside of the city of Orange, uh, right off the 241 toll road. We'll see that on another map here, but Majesca Canyon, at the very end of the canyon, there's a uh, facility operated by Cal State Fullerton known as Tucker Wildlife Sanctuary. And that happens to be right where the trailhead is for the Forest Service Harding Truck Trail. Harding Truck Trail, is uh, not accessible to the public via vehicles. So you can access it on foot or on mountain bike would be the two options, but it is very steep. I have seen hunters on mountain bikes, successful hunters on mountain bikes uh, up that road, but a lot of foot traffic uh, as well. Not nearly as much foot traffic as like Tribuco, but uh, it is uh, something to consider. Okay, so here's Sierra Peak. This is to the far north of the Santa Ana Mountains. The 91 freeway is just out of view here to the north. The city of Corona is gonna be over here to the right. And you can see this trail here, Skyline, Skyline Drive. That drops down into the city of Corona. And that access point is uh, managed by the city of Corona. Years ago, it used to be that you could obtain a vehicle key uh, and access it via your vehicle, but now it's a hike in only. A trail from the city of Corona here. And this is, I got to say, a, a very popular area uh, of the Santa Ana Mountains for deer hunters. There's some space here that really opens up to where you can, you can kind of do some spot and stock hunting uh, all along this area and throughout Main Divide, to be honest. Okay. Moving on. And there's a couple of questions. And I don't know if you're covering them yet or you will. Uh, Couple question, is Indian Truck Trail accessible from Main Divide? Um, it is uh, via foot only. Okay. It's a very yeah. steep, rugged uh, trail. And in my experience with Indian Truck Trail, it's, it's not, I've never seen any success come out of Indian Truck Trail, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, and because it's plain and vegetation. Another question I was asked was, uh, Burn areas from the Holy Gym fire are open. Um, is is uh, near Santiago Peak off limits this year? Uh, that I do not know. 
Okay. Forest Service, uh, generally they, the Tribuco district of that Forest Service, they typically wait right up till hunt season, till the general season before making a decision to reopen or not. Um, chances are from my last conversation with them, it, it looks promising that from Santiago Peak going towards South Main Divide, towards Ortega Highway, that those areas would be open. But it is all dependent on weather conditions, on you know, other environmental factors. So I would I would absolutely check with the Tribuco District Office right up to the date of your hunt, like the day before, to ensure if you're planning like on accessing an area, you definitely want to double check because I've seen changes happen overnight um, in that management unit. Okay, so this map here, to give you a little orientation, the main highlight here is gonna be this, this road here, Bedford Road, or known as Bedford Truck Trail, coming up just south of Corona here off the 15th freeway. This is probably one of the most popular ways uh, that folks are access, folks deer hunting in the D15 are accessing uh, into the remote areas of the Santa Ana Mountains. And by remote areas, I'm talking specifically off Main Divide Road. Main Divide Road is the artery that runs from north to south at the very top of that ridge line and kind of just weaves its way through that mountain. Um, so all these other access points that I listed that I'm talking about are all just ways to access to get you up into that area. And it doesn't mean that, that that's what you're limited to, but a lot of success does come up from off of Main Divide Road, but as well as some of the lower elevations down in the canyons at like the base of some of those access points as well. I've seen it both ways. Um, so Bedford Canyon is what I wanted to highlight here. It's a, a very popular access uh, point for vehicles coming up from the uh, Riverside portion of the mountain. Okay, this might be the last one I have here on the slideshow. Here's Sierra Peak again. We had another view of that earlier. So here's Sierra Peak. Here's the county line. This is Orange County, uh, mainly in view here. Here's the 241 toll road. Um, some of these other canyons to orient you. Here's Irvine Regional Park, a very well-known popular regional park that butts up to a lot of wilderness area. This is all still Orange County wilderness, like open space land, and it's not, not accessible or huntable. Um, to the public here, such as Fremont Canyon. But uh, Black Star Canyon would be of note here. Um, again, off Santiago Canyon Road, um, you're gonna have, like we talked about earlier, Majesca Canyon as a good staging uh, point to access into the forest, but also Black Star Canyon uh, here, which is kind of an interesting piece of property in that it was, acquired by Orange County Parks, the trailhead portion of it anyway, probably about inside of 10 years. And that changed, that made things a little bit complicated initially, but ultimately Orange County Parks did agree to, to allow, to grandfather like hunters uh, into allowing them to transit through that trailhead for the couple of miles that is their, their ownership with their firearm provided that it is in an unloaded, condition. Um, that is accessible. Again, Black Star going up to Main Divide Road is accessible uh, via like mountain bike or or via or on foot. And steep terrain, all it's the same theme all over the D15. There's no there's no great like one great area that I will that I will tell you is uniquely different from all these other uh, areas. But these are kind of the, the highlighted areas. We can do a, a whole webinar in itself on D15 access points and all these small trailheads. But these are the ones that I would recommend and highlight um, to you all here. I think I might have one more. Oh, maybe not. Let me go back to this one real quick. So in this area, right adjacent to Black Star Canyon, and you can't see it on this slide here, but that's going to be uh, Maple Springs Road. So it's Silverado Canyon, which is right adjacent to Black Star Canyon. If you follow that canyon, which is the most popular canyon in Orange County in terms of uh, it being somewhat residential, at the end of that road is, uh, it turns into uh, the Cleveland National Forest and the Maple Springs Road, which is a, probably the most popular trailhead 
uh, on the Orange County side of the Santa Ana Mountains. Very popular amongst off-roaders, just like Tribuco Canyon is. And it's about seven miles to the top of Main Divide Road, where you get to uh, pretty close to Santiago uh, Peak in an area known as Four Corners, which is on, on any given year, it seems to be where, where everybody rendezvous um, come, uh, come deer opener. Okay, moving along here. So, like I mentioned before, very steep, rocky, dense, hot and dry. You are required to operate a street vehicle, a street legal vehicle in the Santa Ana Mountains in that Tribuco district specifically. Uh, four wheel drive is recommended. Conditions can change pretty abruptly um, out there. I've seen the top of Santiago Peak and the upper portions like by four corners full of like icy snow, you know, that has lasted as long as a couple of weeks on some odd years. Uh, food and water, be prepared to, to be there for an extended period of time, even overnight, um, are something you should plan for. Even though mileage wise, it's not, doesn't seem that significant due to the, the elevation gains and the topography and just the, the slow nature of, of how you'll have to travel it would translate into hours of travel. And if you, if you had a flat tire at sunset, for example, you, uh, you, would, you would be in for, for quite the night if you tried to, to walk out of there. Um, it, the cell phone signal has gotten much better over the last like five years. So it's kind of intermittent. There's a lot of dead spots, but for the most part, if you're high up like on Main Divide Road, your cell phone signal seems to work pretty good. So camping, we did touch on that already with Blue Jay Campground being the highlighted area. Okay, herd conditions. So just like everywhere else in these D zones, the populations are considered stable with slight declines since the 60s and 70s. A lot of that primarily due to land management practices um, with us being so good at, at, uh, at uh, wildland fire suppression uh, in particular. Um, the subspecies here are going to be the southern mule deer, and they're considered all resident deer in the Santa Ana Mountains with no seasonal migration patterns. They don't have habitat connectivity, um, so to speak, to where they can migrate to, to other mountain ranges. So they're all they're all resident deer there, and they do they do move into higher elevations and fluctuate, like from being down in the canyons where there's water. They typically move to higher elevations when uh, we get the first heavy rain. But even, even there, the, during those time frames, we I still do see them down low as well. They're, you'll see them year round, even during hunt season at both the top of Main Divide Road and down, down really low in the canyons. Vegetation, it's for the most part, uh, coastal sage scrub mixed chaparral, which is very thick and uh, difficult to navigate through. If you try and do any kind of cross country travel, that is something to consider, particularly if you're on one ridge and you're attempting to, to take a buck on another ridge that's 300 yards away, let's say, um, you definitely want to consider how you're going to get to that animal because vegetation there is unforgiving and impenetrable, to be honest, uh, for the type of habitats that we have there. A suggestion is oak trees. We got a lot of coast live oak that inhibit the area and uh, they don't always, oak trees aren't like other trees that produce acorns or every fall. They're, uh, they seem to, you know, sometimes it'll be several years before an oak tree will produce acorns. So look for areas where oaks are producing acorns and that may help you find more signs of deer. Okay, some more hunting tips. Scouting, preseason scouting is going to be very important, essential, just like anywhere else you're going to hunt. Uh, locating deer activity, deer prints, uh, groups of deer, uh, identifying, you know, game trails, looking for deer activity and scat, bedding areas. Those are all real helpful uh, things to look for. Um, like I mentioned before, getting off the beaten path, off those roads, off on those uh, foot only trails, particularly in the San Mateo Wilderness area, are going to 
going to help you be a little more successful um, in, if nothing else, in steam gear. Uh, binoculars, spotting scopes, binoculars are essential. Uh, getting away from, from traffic seems to be key. And spot and stock is a really popular method for, for hunting in the D15. Uh, that's primarily how I see successful hunters take deer um, versus sitting in a blind, for example. Okay. So this is from the uh, department's website and it lists some like historic productive areas in the D15. And some of these canyons and roads we talked about, some of them we didn't are a little bit more obscure and more remote uh, that I particularly don't have any experience with seeing a, an unusual amount of success from, but uh, you can see there's a lot of overlap with some of what I mentioned before. So we have a great uh, resource for deer hunting in general. And it's the guide to hunting deer in California. And I believe that's gonna be on our links page. A quick note on chronic wasting disease, that'll be covered in much more detail here by our bi biologists uh, later on in the presentation, but we are gonna have uh, a check station there on the weekend of deer opener. Uh, and it's gonna be off South Main Divide Road at the, at the intersection of Ortega Highway and South Main Divide Road. There's a fire station there. And it's probably gonna be like in that parking lot. Historically as well, this isn't, an, uh, this isn't a guarantee, but typically we do like to stage groups of uh, our volunteers out in that same parking area to help with uh, countersigning uh, deer. Okay, on to regulations real quick. I, was, I have one more question for you related to that south uh, area. Sure. Uh, is Margarita Peak uh, okay to hunt being so close to Northern Camp Pendleton? I'm not familiar. I'll have to get back to whoever's question that is. I'll have to look at a map real carefully and to be able to answer that question. Okay. Thank you. Okay, there is a non-lead restriction in place as of July, 2019. Non-lead ammo is required in California. Deer harvest reporting. Most of us, it sounds like, have experienced hunting and are familiar with this and our other panelists will talk about this as well, but you do, we got to emphasize that you do, if you're successful, you do need to validate the tag. And that means filling out portions, both portions of the tag, permanently marking the date of the kill, marking the location. It's pretty self-explanatory. You don't need to make notes on any of this. The tag tells you line by line what you need to, to do uh, if, you, if you take the time to read it in detail. And you attach it to the handlers immediately. Um, that means, like right then and there, as soon as you get to the animal, that's the very first thing that you would do is complete your tag and affix it to the animal's antlers before field dressing, before taking your pictures. Like that's the very first thing we want to see hunters do out in the field. And then you have your tag countersigned. Again, uh, you need to do that. Basically, you need to make arrangements so that you go from the field to the nearest location where you can get that tag countersigned. And like I said, come opening season in the D15 zone, our department of volunteers traditionally are out in that, that area off Ortega Highway. And that seems to be, uh, it seems to have worked out really well. We get a number of, of, uh, of deer brought to that station every opening weekend. Uh, and of course you have to report and return the tag to uh, CDFW, to our department. Let's see here. So when we report, Within 30 days of harvest or by January 31st, whichever is first, unsuccessful, you must report uh, that you're unsuccessful by January 31st. We want everybody to uh, report. You can do that online or by mail. Okay, D zone specific regulation. And this applies to all the other zones that you're gonna be, that we're gonna be presenting to you, including the 11 and 13, but they open on the second Saturday of October. And we're talking, this is for the general season, the general rifle season, and extends for 30 consecutive days. Uh, one buck, four corn or better per tag in the D15. Uh, in the D15, 1,500 tags are issued out, and I have never seen a year where they sell out. So it is over the counter for D15. Archery. 
So archer hunting within the general deer zone is permitted. Uh, so you have, obviously if it's during archery season, it's archery only equipment. Uh, and it opens just like with the other D zones on the first Saturday in September and extends for 23 days. And in the D15, that's gonna be one buck or corner better. Forest Service in the Tribuco District of the Cleveland National Forest has specific regulations within that management unit. And you should check with them for any updated information. But one of the ones that stands out and seems to be of, of, uh, of notation here is, is the regulation they have of hunting within 150 yards of a campground or a trail. Um, and you know, it, it goes on with what other things like a fire station and buildings, but in particular, that's, that's a big challenge for hunters in the D15 is that regulation there of 150 yards of a campground and a trail. Just something to be aware of. Okay, if there's any questions, I'll monitor and look for them. I know some of you folks sent some emails out and if I didn't answer your question, I'll, I'll review them and I'll reach out to you directly if you provided contact information. Thank you. All right, Amelia, you, you're up. I don't want to tell you Ryan took all your time, but uh, I'm gonna go fast. So I'll try to. <laughs> all right, share my screen. Okay, can everyone see my screen? No, no, there you go. It's up. Okay, great. All right, so I will be going over the D11 hunt zone. Okay, so really quick, here is a map of the D11 zone. Um, majority of this is going to be Angeles National Forest within here, but I will note that uh, San Bernardino National Forest does come in on the east end over here. There's not too much, it's just the corner east end of the D11 zone. So um, the majority of it's Angeles National Forest, uh, also known as San Gabriel Mountains. I have provided the general contact number for Angeles National Forest headquarters right above here. However, um, for specific areas, if you are in the central portion of Angeles National Forest to the western portion, you'd want to contact Los Angeles Gateway Ranger District right here. I have provided their contact information. Or if you are on the easternmost portion of Angeles National Forest, the part that butts up right against San Bernardino National Forest, you're going to want to contact the San Gabriel Monuments National Mon Mo Mountains National Monument. Their information is right here. We also have plenty of maps that we can provide to you guys. Uh, the best way to get a hold of these maps is through the Angeles National Forest Maps website. All of these links that I have on the slide here will be provided to you in a links page that we will provide um, after the presentation today. But I do just want to make a quick note that there are online interactive maps that are available for you down here through Forest Service or through the BLM online national data map. Okay, so land ownership. Uh, it's primarily Angeles National Forest, as I said earlier, some San Bernardino National Forest. And I do also want to note that D11 includes five wilderness areas within the hunt zone. Um, there is also some Bureau of Land Management lands. There's not much of it, but it does exist out there, um, also known as BLM land. And then there is private land as well. Um, you can hunt there if you have written permission from the property owner. Um, make sure you have that written permission in possession while you're hunting on private land. Um, and I always want to emphasize, make sure you have your GPS, maps, or apps with you to stay in compliance because hunter trespass will be enforced. Okay, as I said earlier, there are five wilderness areas within the D11 hunt zone. Um, as Ryan stated earlier for D15, same goes with Angeles. Uh, these wilderness areas are gonna provide great habitat away from a lot of human activity. So if you can, I highly suggest getting out there. However, I do suggest uh, checking with your local ranger district 
to see if there are any permits or any other regulations required for going out into a wilderness area. Okay, to get deer tags um, for D11, the tag categories are as follows. Um, there is the J13 and A31 premium deer hunts. There are no restricted deer hunts and the unrestricted deer hunts is the general D11 season and archery only. Okay, so here is some harvest data for all three of the zones that we're talking about today. And this is from 2016 to 2020. Um, so the D11 zone uh, gets the highest amount of tags, that's 5,500, followed by D13 with 4,000 and then D15 with 1,500. And so really quick, just look at this data over here, the percentages. This is the hunter success rate. Um, so D13 seems to be the, the most consistent with about 11% throughout the years. Uh, D15 has the lowest percent rate, uh, success rate with about 7% throughout the years. And then D11 has, uh, it varies from 9% to 13% throughout the years. And then on this slide, we are going to go into uh, the types of bucks that were taken for each zone that we're talking about today. So as you can see, a majority of the bucks reported to us, um, unfortunately, we don't know what the unreported numbers are. However, I would assume that they look pretty, pretty similar to what we're looking at right now. Okay, so reported uh, bucks to us is, majority of them are two point bucks for all, uh, all three of the zones, and then followed by three point bucks, four point, and then five point, with D11 having the most five point bucks uh, at seven. And this is for the 2019 uh, harvest. Okay, so I wanna go over hunter access for um, the D11 hunt zone. We'll start in the north. So Highway 138, if you can see my cursor here, that follows along. Um, that's going to get you along the northern portion of the D11 hunt zone. But I also want to point out Big Pines Highway. That starts right about the Wrightwood area, and that follows clo more closely to Angeles National Forest. And um, there's a lot of good hunt, um, hunting opportunities off of Big Pines Highway over here. Oops, sorry. To the east. We have um, Interstate 15 as the main travel corridor, uh, but I also want to point out Lytle Creek Road. That's going to take you into Lytle Creek uh, right over here on the east end. I do want to point out that if you decide to check out this area, it's going to be the Sierra Avenue exit. Uh, Sierra Avenue eventually becomes Lytle Creek Road. But yeah, there's a lot of great habitat out there. I've seen a lot of hunters out there, so it's a great place to check out. All right, to the south, we have a lot of access from the south side. Um, the 210 is gonna be the main travel corridor. Um, this will lead you to Highway 2 or Angeles Crest Highway. And Highway 2 actually goes all the way through Angeles National Forest. It will spit you out near Wrightwood, California on the east end of the forest. But I also wanna point out Upper Big Tehunga Canyon Road. It's really hard to see in the map, but it's this white road right here. Um, this is Upper Big Tehunga Canyon Road. There are four service roads off of that um, road, and there's also several trails off of that road. So that can provide some good hunting opportunity for you. I will note that I believe majority of these four service roads are closed to the public, so it would be hike in only. However, it does provide a better, a, a flatter surface to hike in on. Um, and then, Right here, we have Angeles Forest Highway that comes off of Highway 2, and this will lead you all the way into the Palmdale area. And one of the roads that I want to point out off of there is the Mount Gleason Road, um, also known as Forest Service Route 3N17. That is going to follow the green dotted line right here in my map. Um, that is the um, the main trail, um, I'm forgetting the name of it right now, but um, that is the Mount Gleason Road. And I wanted to point this one out because I believe this Forest Service Road is now open to the public. It was closed for many years because of the station fire, um, but I believe it is accessible now. And there are campgrounds um, back in that road. However, 
I would highly suggest checking with Angeles National Forest to see if those campgrounds are open or closed to the public. And then the last road I want to go over on the south side is Highway State Route 39. Um, it's this one right here that comes out of Azusa, goes all the way up to Highway 2. However, I want to point out that the last five miles of Highway 39 are actually closed to public vehicles. So if you want to access this road for uh, hunting opportunities, you're going to have to enter and exit through Azusa, the city of Azusa. And then to the west, the main highway that we have up here is Interstate 5. Uh, we also have Highway 14 that will take you into Palmdale. And then I also wanted to point out Pine Canyon Road um, that goes through like Lake Hughes and then up to Three Point. Um, off of this road, Pine Canyon Road, you're going to find Forest Route 7 and 23, and that's going to lead you into a bunch of um, other Forest Service roads um, within this part of Angeles National Forest. Uh, this here, the Green Dog Line, is the Pacific Crest Trail, um, so it follows along there. However, there's a lot of good hunting opportunities up there, a lot of great habitat as well. And um, the Forest Road is open to the public off of Pine Canyon Road. And then the last road that I want to go over is Lake Hughes Road. Um, that one goes from Lake Hughes all the way down near the uh, Lake, uh, Kaseic Lake. And so there's a little hunting opportunities that you can check out off of Lake Hughes Road as well. Okay, and another thing I want to go over in terms of accessibility is the Bobcat Fire Forest Service closure that we have going on right now. And I believe this is going on until 2022. Uh, this map is provided online and I believe there's also a link on the page that we will pro be providing to you after this presentation. I just wanna make note that this is closed to the public right now. Um, you can travel through, however, um, you should only be traveling through and not stopping or hunting on the Bobcat Fire closure. Um, but I definitely suggest always uh, reaching out to Angeles National Forest to find out more information about this closure. Okay, weather conditions and travel tips. Um, so just like D15, it's going to be really steep and rocky. There's going to be dense vegetation. It will likely be hot and dry, especially with the year that we're having so far. Um, I want to point out that there's limited to no cell service in most of Angeles National Forest. So be prepared for that. If you're using your cell phone um, for maps, uh, make sure you have those downloaded or you have an app that can be used offline. Also, make sure you bring plenty of food and water. Uh, really got to stay hydrated out there if you're going to be out there for a while. And also, it can get cooler at the higher elevations. With Angeles National Forest, you can be at 500 feet or you can be at like almost 10,000 feet with the highest peak being just about 10,000 feet. So make sure you come prepared for that. Make sure you have layers and it can also be really windy during the fall. So be prepared for that as well. Okay, so camping. Um, I highly recommend checking out the Angeles National Forest campgrounds website or if you have a physical map, the campground should be listed on that map as well. Um, the link for campgrounds will be provided on that page that I mentioned earlier. However, I just want to point out that campsites are first come first serve uh, with a maximum 14 day stay at a site. Also, campsites may be used by a maximum of eight people and a maximum of two vehicles. There are also fire restrictions right now within Angeles National Forest. I believe there are no camp fires or stoves are allowed. However, double check with Angeles National Forest to see what the specific fire recommendations are for that time of year. Okay, herd conditions. So the subspecies of the deer in D11 are the California mule deer. Um, the deer in D11 are also considered resident deer with no seasonal migrations. So they have a relatively small home range with less than one square mile. Um, the D11 population is considered stable. Uh, the 2017 population estimate was about 7,717 based off of hunter tags um, that were sent into us and some survey data as well. 
and the long-term population trend has been steady to slightly declining over the last several decades. I also want to make note that they shift around seasonally to better use the seasonal variation in forage conditions, so um, the food that they eat is going to vary season to season. They also do this to take advantage of hiding and for thermal cover. Okay, habitat. So it's widely varied. Um, there's going to be a lot of mixed chaparral, oak woodlands, desert scrub, and pine mountains. Um, also a lot of riparian areas, as shown in the picture on the slide. So deer in this area respond favorably to vegetation disturbances, like a wildfire. Um, the wildfire will provide new growth, and that new growth provides all of the important nutrients that deer need. So riparian areas, as seen in the picture, um, they provide a lot of nutritious forage for the deer. They also provide thermal cover and water. So those are all essential for deer. In the late summer, deer will feed in the heavy cover of the canyon bottoms, help them stay cool. Um, and in September, the oak trees become really popular as deer search for acorns. But as uh, Ryan mentioned in his slideshow, um, not every oak tree will produce acorns, so you really want to make sure you're looking out for the trees that are in production right here. And then generally speaking, forage and water, or the lack of water, will, be, uh, will determine where the deer will be from year to year. Okay, as Ryan mentioned earlier, um, the same hunting tips go for D11. Um, really want to make sure you do that preseason scouting uh, if you're looking for those individuals or those groups of deer. And while you're out there, you want to look for deer trails um, along the side of, of the mountains. You want to look for scat, um, their feeding areas, and their bedding areas. Um, most successful hunters do uh, more hiking to locate deer. So you, you're going to have to put in the work to find out where these guys are. And then, as Ryan said earlier, um, you want to attempt to hunt in areas that are away from other activities and people. There are going to be a lot of hikers in Angeles National Forest, so you want to make sure that you stay away from those trails, where that, especially the popular ones, where a lot of people will be. Okay, and then really quick, I just want to show you guys this map. Um, this is um, hunter tags from 2019, I believe. And so when you turn in your tag, you, uh, you write where you um, took that deer. And so with that information, we were able to make this map of where deer were taken in 2019. And I just want to point out that it's pretty scattered throughout Angeles National Forest. Um, as I said earlier, this is Highway 39. This can provide you a lot of great hunting opportunities. But also over here, I want to point out that this is the... Uh, Big Pines Canyon Road over here. Um, so a lot of good uh, hunting opportunities over there. And then over here we have Angeles Crest Highway along with uh, Upper Big Tahunga Canyon Road and Angeles Forest Highway. So it's pretty spread out. Okay, so for D11, it shall open on the second Saturday in October and extend for 30 consecutive days. So for this season in 2021, that will be October 9th through November 7th. Uh, the bag and possession limit is one buck for torn or better. Uh, the number of tags that will be available this year is 5,500. And hunters that possess a D11 tag may also hunt in D15 or D13. That's why we're here today. Archery is also allowed in during the general um, hunting season. So I won't go over that too much. And then again, just like with Cleveland, um, Angeles also has Forest Service regulations, um, no hunting within 150 yards of any buildings, dwellings, campgrounds, et cetera. And then last but not least, um, I wanna go over chronic wasting disease in the area really quick. Um, there is actually no chronic wasting disease in California, which is great. However, we are actively looking for it every year. It's part of our surveillance program with um, the statewide surveillance program. So we will have a check station in D11. It will be on the east side at the Lytle Creek Ranger Station. And that will be opening and closing weekend throughout the day. However, I suggest checking out the CDFW um, Chronic Wasting Disease website for more information. And that again will be provided in the link page that we send out to you guys. 
All right. Are you able to stop share or do you want me to do that? All right. You're on, Dustin. Awesome. Thank uh, you, Amelia. Yeah, thank you, Amelia. Uh, can you guys hear me okay right now? Just doing You're a quick good. sound check. Um, then I was also going to ask, um, uh, in terms of uh, just a quick time check, um, you know, when should I probably plan on wrapping this up so we can give time for Jake? Um, you'll you'll do good, Dustin. Just go through it at your pace, and you'll you'll figure it out. All right. Everybody wants this section. I have people <laughs> telling me, "Go ahead and preach, brother." <laughs> All right. I'll do my best. Um, so again, but, I'm. But do it quickly. <laughs> <laughs> do it quickly. Got it. Um, so again, I'll be going over the D13 hunting zone, and I'm going to focus mainly on hunter access, uh, really because it's a highly variable zone, and uh, there's a lot of different areas that uh, you can find yourself, and it really kind of depends on which uh, habitat you're really wanting to fit into, and also generally where you can access it and where you're visiting from. So just moving through the slides. The zone itself is going to be situated in mostly Ventura County, Kern County, and then a small portion in Santa Barbara and Ventura counties, uh, just over here, uh, going to the west. And the majority of that is going to be Los Padres National Forest. Uh, and again, just for as for the other zones, the archery season, September 4th through September 26th for 2021, and the general season, October 9th through November 7th as well. Moving along for this, if you are needing to contact or have any questions for the Forest Service, there are two ranger districts uh, that we have for D13, Mount Pinos Ranger District to the north and the Ojai Ranger District to the south here. Um, I've listed their contact information. Their offices are closed right now, so the main way to get a hold of them would be uh, to use those numbers. Um, it's going to provide a lot of access. It's about 550,000 acres of U.S. Forest Service land. Um, and you're going to have some pretty high elevation areas, Mount Pinos at 8,800 8, feet um, in elevation. Uh, include, included within that link package as well, um, it's always good to just check and see whether there are road closures and just what the current conditions are. Um, so that link at the bottom there, which is available in that link package, will take you to their websites. Similar to some of the other zones, um, you can access uh, maps of this area basically through the U.S. Forest Service, through the Los Padres offices. You can get those online. Um, and then there also are some online hunt zone maps, which I've included in that link package. Uh, one of them takes you to static PDF maps that CDFW has. Um, as well as an interactive one. So that one can be a little bit more useful, you know, especially as you're doing e-scouting. The land ownership. So uh, again, primarily this is gonna be um, all those Padres National Forest in that light green. Um, this area to the north, that's gonna be the Wind Wolves Preserve. So that is not accessible for hunting. Uh, you will have a little bit of scattering of BLM shown in the yellow. Uh, just to the northwest in this light blue area that's off to the east, just off Highway 5. Uh, that is going to be Hungry Valley State um, OHB Park. Uh, Jake Coombs, who's going to be speaking after, will touch on this, but just so you guys are aware, you're not allowed to hunt within the state park. Um, it is an access zone, but um, again, just you need to follow the rules when you're moving through there. Uh, additionally, there are wilderness areas within this. Uh, there are some private lands. Um, as well available, you know, if you do have written permission uh, to be able to access those. And the main thing is just, you know, to follow the rules, use your maps, use your GPS uh, applications, uh, just to stay in compliance when you're out there. So on to hunter access. Um, just listed here are basically the secondary access roads that really allow you to get into different areas uh, to hunt within D13. Um, but the you know, primary access points are going to be off Interstate 5, uh, Highways 126, 166, um, as well as 33. So to take a quick look at those. 
Um, so right here, um, basically to the north, we have Highway 5 uh, cutting north-south over here. Fraser Park Mountain Road, which comes in, which gives you access to many locations uh, around Fraser Mountain. Uh, cutting south is Lockwood Valley Road that cuts all the way across to Highway 33, which is shown over here, north-south uh, to the west. And then you also have Mill Potrero or Cuddy Valley Highway uh, that's just to the north. Uh, that other access point that I mentioned before uh, in Hungry Valley OHV State Park, uh, this is going to take you into Gold Hill Road and again is going to give you more access further south, uh, taking you towards Alamo Mountain. Talking about locations where we typically see deer taken within this northern portion of the zone, um, it's going to be Fraser Mountain, Alamo Mountain, Takuya Mountain, Camp Marion, the Dome Springs area, and then as well as Apache Canyon, Quetal, and Bollinger Canyon. The thing to note with this next slide, again, the light green areas that we're showing here are uh, Los Padres National Forest. You're gonna note that most of the areas where we are seeing deer taken um, are areas where there is access. So any of the lines that you're seeing on here are either forest service roads or OHV roads that uh, for the most part are gonna be accessible and open just depending on the conditions. Um, so again, it's just where there's access, it's where we tend to see more deer taken. Um, and across the board, we do tend to see more deer taken in that northern section of B13. Uh, the thing to note though, in the light green that I just pulled up, uh, these are the wilderness areas that are within B13. Uh, it's not that there's no deer, no deer that are in those areas, um, it's just access is much more difficult. But you know, I definitely would recommend for folks, you know, if you're into backpacking and can get out um, into some of these areas, it's definitely worth it. Uh, just to avoid some of the other hunters and kind of get into some new areas that are, you know, less pressured. So moving to the southern portion here, again, we have I-5 cutting north-south. We have Highway 126 over here, and Sespe Creek is this border that meets up with Highway 33 off to the west. Uh, you do have access over at Rose Valley, which is going to give you access to Sespe Creek uh, down here. Uh, you're also going to have um, access as well at Good Enough Road, um, and then also getting access through here to Lake Piru. Uh, again, pulling up areas where we're seeing deer taken. Uh, Sespe Creek is one of them. Pine Mountain, there's also an additional road that takes you along the ridge to get to Pine Mountain. Uh, Yellow Jacket Trail, uh, that's definitely a very popular area. There are a lot of different canyons to really go into in this zone. Uh, McDonald Peak, which is going to be just south of Alamo Mountain. It's definitely a trek to get there. You definitely are going to need four-wheel drive, but um, it's definitely worth checking out that zone. And then as well as Lake Piru. Similar to what we had seen before, most of the areas where we're seeing deer taken primarily is where we're going to have access. Um, and the southern portion also has the most wilderness area within it. So again, if you're willing to get out there a little bit further, there's plenty of areas that are gonna have deer. It's just a matter of whether you're gonna be able to get access to them. The other thing I'll point out here is that access when you're coming from the south, that that is gonna be through a uh, good enough road. Um, we have the condor sanctuary, the California condor sanctuary there. No hunting is allowed within that preserve. So basically your access points, if you're accessing through Sesame Creek or if you're going up through, I believe it's Squaw Valley uh, Road, You'll be able to go through these areas to get north of Sespe Creek, um, but there's gonna be no hunting allowed. There will be signage when you're going through these areas, but that's something to be aware of. The other thing I'll just briefly note, the Southern portions are also where we have seen um, fires primarily. These are the larger fires that have occurred within D13. Uh, we have the Day Fire in 2006, the Wolf in 2002, the Piru in 2003, and the Ranch in 07. Um, when you're moving through these areas, um, definitely take note of just uh, the fact that these fires have opened up some habitat for deer. Uh, so it can be really useful and you will notice that the vegetation, especially in the southern portions of D13, is going to be um, fairly different from some of the other areas when you're moving further north. I'll touch a little bit on habitats, um, but I just wanted to briefly point that out for you. 
I'll glaze over this really quickly since Amelia had already hit this. Again, hunter success uh, is going to be relatively low for all three zones, but they are consistent uh, year to year. Um, so, you know, if you really are willing to put in the work, get out there, um, you can be successful, but um, it will be, you know, compared to some other zones, um, a little bit harder. Uh, the other thing, again, just to note, uh, the majority of the animals and the bucks that we're seeing taken are going to be forked horns or two by twos. Um, and for D13, again, these are reported. So there was about 30% non-reporting rate. So you would have to adjust those numbers slightly. Uh, 200 that were two, uh, 205 that were 2.50 that were 3.13 that were four point and just one that was a five point or above. The herd conditions for this, so uh, they are considered stable, same thing as the other zones. Uh, the population number is roughly 3,000 for D13. Um, and again, similar just to what had been referenced with the other presentations. Um, there has been uh, kind of a long-term decline since the 1960s and 70s. Um, a lot of that due to land management practices and changes. Uh, the subspecies of deer are going to be the California mule deer. This is similar to D11. Um, they are considered resident deer, uh, but the thing to note is depending on the conditions, they will move uh, down in elevation. So in some cases, we will get snow uh, that will be occurring kind of later in that season. Um, and that really will cause a little bit more movement and shifting of those animals. So moving on to the habitats, it is highly varied within uh, D13, um, but for the most part, you're gonna have oak woodlands and uh, mixed montane chaparral, hardwood and hardwood conifer through a lot of these areas. Um, again, the deer in this, uh, in this zone are gonna respond favorably to any kind of uh, vegetation disturbance, whether that be fire um, or timber harvesting. And it's definitely good to know, especially where you're seeing oaks, that can be very beneficial for finding deer. Just to give you a different view, and one thing to really think about for this year is water. Uh, we are in a drought. Ventura County had the uh, lowest precipitation that it has had basically since they've been recording in 1895. Uh, so it's extremely dry in some of these areas. So the deer are going to have to respond to that and go for water. Um, so definitely key in on those water sources where you can, where you're seeing deer sign um, around water. That's something that, you know, can be very useful. And again, just to give you a little bit of an idea of kind of what these areas look like, you will have more open. This was a burned area in the upper left with some black oak that is actually coming in, um, as well as ponderosa, Jeffrey pines kind of mixed in. This area on the upper right, this would be Apache Canyon, uh, Quetal and Ballinger, and uh, this can get referred to as the Kiama Badlands. Um, it's a very different, much drier uh, zone, and uh, will give you a completely different kind of sense of what D13 is uh, compared to these other areas. Um, and then again, it can get much more forested. Um, and then for a lot of these areas, you will see a lot of these basins and bowls where you're going to have some protected areas where you are seeing um, more conifers. Um, and then for the most part, a lot of this is going to be chaparral or ceanothus that is mixed in. Um, a lot of that are going to be what the deer are going for. Uh, they will go for ceanothus, chemise, um, white thorn, um, as well as, you know, scrub oak and other oaks when they are producing acorns as well. So that's something to think about. So hunting tips, very similar to um, what had been discussed for the other uh, two zones, preseason scouting is definitely going to be key um, in trying to locate those individuals and groups of deer uh, when you can, um, and identifying you know, recently used deer trails and any feeding and bedding areas. Uh, for this zone specifically, I will say definitely the successful hunters are going to be the ones that are going to be uh, hiking further to locate deer. That's something you really really should do um, and try to avoid where you're seeing concentrations of other hunters, vehicles, campers that are out there um, and try to use the weather to your advantage. Uh, just as last year we had a snowstorm that came in for the closing weekend. Um, many hunters were not actually out there just because of the conditions but uh, when you are having some of those extreme uh, weather events it will force deer to move uh, and kind of you know respond to that. 
So trying to make sure you're using some of those uh, weather patterns kind of to your advantage as much as possible. Uh, just touching on weather conditions, um, I will say the main thing is that it's going to be very variable in the temps. It can be warmer during the day. Often it is pretty mild, especially during the uh, actual zone uh, period. But the main thing um, is going to be that we can get snow and rain later in the season. Um, and then additionally, it will get extremely cold at night in some of these areas, especially if you are at higher elevation. Um, I would recommend four wheel drive, uh, especially for a lot of these forest roads, um, bring food and water, and then definitely check any current closures and fire restrictions. Uh, the fire restriction part of that will definitely be a big one this year. Uh, some other hunting that you can do, this will uh, be both for D11 and D13 bear hunting. Uh, it'll open concurrently uh, with the general season of the D zones. Um, and it will be ending December 26. Um, and if you do want to find any more information, again, that linkage package will take you right to our website. And Jake will be touching a little bit more on that in a minute. Um, and then additionally, something to think about quail hunting. Uh, we do have a lot of folks that will go out deer hunting, um, but also do a little bit of quail that's going to open up during that season. Uh, you will find mountain and valley quail present through a lot of those canyons, a lot of those riparian areas. Uh, so it's definitely a fun thing to do, you know, while you're out there for the deer season. I'll go over this relatively quickly, um, just given time, but chronic wasting disease, it's a fatal neuro neurodegenerative disease of cervid. So that would be mule deer, whitetail, uh, elk, and moose. And it's similar to scrapie and goats and sheep and mad cow and cattle. Uh, this was something that's been known about since the 60s, wasn't really found in free ranging populations until the 80s. Um, but the main thing to point out here is effective treatment for it does not exist and management practices to prevent uh, disease transmission are extremely limited. Um, what, what is actually causing this is a malformed protein uh, that tends to build up in mammalian brains um, and will lead to kind of wasting over time, generally what you're seeing up here on the right. Uh, but it gets spread throughout deer populations and also can be spread out through, uh, through the environment as well. So it's a pretty wicked problem. Uh, it has not been detected in California, but we are currently conducting disease surveillance. Uh, the closest states that CWD is found in would be Utah, New Mexico, and Idaho. And again, just on that linkage pack, package, um, you can go find out more information about this as well as where we have locations where we'll be sampling. Um, and then uh, with this one, the main thing to say is just to bring in the whole deer or the head with the two to four inches of the neck attached if you are going to have this sampled. Um, and for any out-of-state hunters, uh, the main thing is to not bring in any brain or spinal cord. If you are hunting out-of-state and bringing meat back, uh, best thing to do is package that meat or bring in finished taxidermy mounts. So just briefly, Noting the locations, and these were discussed before, D13 is going to be at Lockwood Valley Road and Grade Valley Road. For D11, that will be off Lytle Creek. And for D15, that will be off Highway 74 and the South Main Divide. And with that, um, I believe we need to move on to Jake. Hopefully I moved through that quickly enough. But if you guys do have any questions, do feel free to reach out over email. Thanks, Dustin. Great job. Jake, you have the conch and go ahead. Sounds great. Thanks, Dustin. I appreciate it. Give me one second to share my screen here. All right. Can you guys see that? Yeah, just switch it to slideshow and you'll be good. All right. All right, everybody. I'm just going to wrap up due to time. I got to take off here pretty quickly, but I'm going to go through uh, my portion of the D13 hunting information. My name is Jake Coombs. I'm a lieutenant supervisor for North LA County, but I spent the majority of my career working in the D13 area, validating deer, enforcing uh, wildlife crimes, as well as uh, working with the community and just seeing the deer herds over the last uh, decade or so. So we're going to go over just some basic information pertaining to hunting in general, as well as more specifically to the D13 hunting area. 
So required licenses and tags. Uh, most people here are probably hunters already, but there are some, and we've answered some questions already regarding to what's required to go hunting. Um, first, you have to start with your hunter safety course. And then from there, you're authorized to obtain a valid hunting license. You're gonna need a valid deer tag to hunt the particular zone that you wish to hunt. And how to obtain those, again, are down below at the slide and we've already gone over majority of these. Specifically to D13, uh, D13 tags can be acquired over the counter and do not require any preference points. D13, 11, and 15 uh, deer tags are interchangeable. Bear opens consistently with the general deer, uh, D13, D11, and D15 um, hunting areas, but specifically bear are really only found in D11 and D13. Bear tags, um, are something that is very unique in comparison to, to deer validation. There was a couple of questions that came out is where do I go to get my deer tag signed? And uh, one of the panelists answered in the front of the reg book and just provided a list of all the people that can validate a deer. Bear tags, it's very different. If you harvest a bear, it has to be uh, countersigned by a CDFW employee. You can work through the Caltip hotline to help uh, contact or get you in touch with somebody that can validate your bear. Something unique to bear hunting, bear skull. Any person who takes a bear shall present the skull to the department within 10 days of taking the bear. The department may take the bear skull um, and it may become property of the department for scientific purposes. And then once it's completed, it will be returned to you if you harvest a bear. All right, deer hunting seasons. Dustin went over the D13 hunting um, season. Uh, D11 is the same as well as D15, so it's all the same hunting season. Bear archery season is something unique. It shall open on the third Saturday in August and extend for 23 consecutive days. But when it comes to bear rifle general season, it's going to open on the same day as the general deer season. Uh, something unique about bear hunting that if the department has recorded 1,700 bears that have been taken throughout the state. They will close the bear season and they will notify you either through mail. They will also contact news and media outlets to make this notification. And also, again, like I said, send you something in the mail. Uh, if not, it extends till the very end of the, of the year, pretty much December 26th is your actual date of the open bear season. All right, we've had several questions of what is a legal buck? So I have a slide here that's called buck only and either sex defined because this is important depending on where you hunt throughout the state as well as late season hunts. You might run into a tag that doesn't say necessarily say doe only, it says either sex and what does that mean? So below is a legally harvested buck with the branch of the antler in the upper two, upper two thirds of the antler. So when you look at an antler, you're gonna separate it into thirds. You're gonna want a branch in the upper two thirds of the antler, not the bottom. Uh, that signifies a legal deer. And obviously you have to follow your tagging requirements and affix the tag to the antler when you're on a buck only hunt. Below is our two pictures of a spike. What we refer to as a spike is a, basically a one prong antler on one side of the animal's head. Um, sometimes you might only have one antler sticking out of the, the skull. Others, you might have two single antlers out of uh, both sides, the left and the right side with no branch in the upper two thirds. The reason why we say no branch is in, if you look at the pictures, if you look at the arrow, you'll see what looks like a little branch at the bottom. We refer to this as an eye guard and it is in the bottom one third, which does not qualify in the upper two thirds to be a legal deer. Next is just a traditional spike buck without an eye guard. The reason why this picture is there is if you have an either sex tag and you're looking at this animal right here, this deer, you're gonna see antlers that look or appear to be less than three inches. According to the law, if you have an either sex tag, you are allowed or authorized to harvest a spike buck as long as those antlers are less than three inches. People tend to say, well, how can I tell being so far away? And um, biologists have typically said that the tip of the ear represents the three inch line. And that's mainly if you were to take a shot at a deer and the ears were to block the antlers, that gives you the benefit of the doubt as the hunter. So that's why that law is there and allows you to harvest that animal. All right, additional laws and regulations. And this is more for just 
for your guys' reference, I copy and pasted the back two pages of the regulation booklet. You can look at our apartment website, download them on your phone. You can put them in your iBooks if you have an iPhone or download them to whatever folder if you have a different um, phone outlet, whether it's Samsung or whatever. But these are other hunting laws related to hunting. They address just common sense laws as far as safety, discharging firearms. As you can tell, trespass, believe it or not, trespass is a common sense law. If you, if it looks like the property belongs to somebody, it usually is. And so uh, do your due diligence and do your homework before you enter that property. It's going to talk about the legal requirements of trespass. It talks about parks and refuges as well. What is a park? What is a refuge? When can I go in there? When can't I hunt there? Uh, it's for most part, most parks and refuges are closed to hunting with some exceptions. Dustin did mention that um, the entrance into Alamo, you have to pass through Hungry Valley State Park and it is closed to hunting and you have to actually transport your firearm differently while, while traveling through that state park until you get outside the boundary and head up the mountain. And then the last page of the regulation booklet, it is unlawful too. And it just goes over just various scenarios um, from paperwork, documentation, taking an animal within um, so many feet or yards of bait, as well as shooting too close or hunting too close to an occupied dwelling, uh, some safety tips and um, issues. So D13 local information, this is where as a game warden, I'm just gonna touch on some things that I've run into in the past. Um, on some hot spots in Ventura County and D13 specifically. We have some major trespass issues up the Squaw Flat oil fields and in the Condor Reserve above Fillmore. If it is posted, fenced, three signs to every mile, as well as, like you said, if it looks like it's, it belongs to somebody else, it usually does, contact either the oil company or the property landowner. Do your due diligence. Onyx is a great way to get in touch with people. If you can't, you can always go down to uh, the Forest Service. A lot of them, they have MOU agreements or lease agreements, and you can work with them to get in contact with someone to see if you can get written permission. I can generally tell you that if you like to hunt this area, most of the oil fields deny permission just because of the issues they've had in the past. And obviously the Condor Reserve or Preserve up there is you cannot hunt there. It's uh, monitored by the US Fish and Wildlife Service as well as enforced by us and their agents. Hungry Valley State Park, trespass and firearm laws. You cannot obviously trespass into Hungry Valley State Park. It's very important that you pay attention to the boundaries. They are fenced, they are signed. And then also transporting your firearm through a state park. It is a lot different than just being out on the open road in huntable areas. You want to make sure that all ammunition is out of your firearm. Lake Piru, there's some trespass issues there. Just make sure you're outside the lake boundaries and you're actually in the national forest. Hunter success. A lot of people ask me this question throughout the year. Um, what's the best area to go for me to have success? And uh, a lot of times I tell them, well, get out, do your homework, scout. Um, the more time you put in, the more likely you are to be successful. But I will offer this tip. Uh, the north end of the county, northern Ventura County, Alamo, Great Valley, Fraser Mountain, deep accessible roads into the forest. We see a lot more success come out of just the general public, just the large masses of people that like to go back there and hunt for a weekend, we tend to see more success out of those areas. Not to say that you're not successful in the south end of the county, guys that really do their homework, it's just um, a lot less accessible land and it's just as populated as the north end. Another, another tip for hunting in uh, Ventura County, it is steep, very tough terrain, can be hot at times. And then also, if it doesn't feel like it's hot out, it's very easily um, or easy to be dehydrated um, when you're not prepared. So bring food, bring water, and bring su survival supplies. Every year, whether it's on the opener or the closure, we are always having to do some sort of hunter rescue and work with um, uh, search and rescue from the Ventura County Sheriff's Department. Another issue that we have is people are not prepared to pack out their animal. Um, it leads to dehydration issues because they're uh, incapable of packing out that much meat. Do your research, do your homework, figure out how to bone out an animal if you have to, but do what you have to do. It is your responsibility to make sure that you do not waste that animal. And then again, hunter rescue stories I have at the bottom. Uh, every year, it seems like we have a, a story that either gets put out on social media or through the sheriff's department, Nixle, of basically a hunter 
that was stranded, either disoriented or just ran out of water. And it's just uh, simple things to where if you carried GPS, a map, and you brought uh, ample food and water that you would have been just fine. And I believe that's pretty much it. So turn it over. All right. And how do I unshare? I'll go ahead and stop it for you. Okay. You so, well, audience, you know, a lot of you are still with us. Thank you for maintaining uh, your uh, contact with us. We had probably a record number of questions that we ever had to uh, answer. Uh, I see 86 in our query box. Um, kept our panelists very busy and we're sorry if we didn't get to them all, but uh, you can always reach out to me. If I can't answer it, I will forward it to the appropriate uh, person. I will be sending out an email later that will be uh, include all the links that were posted tonight. Uh, there will be a recording of this. Um, I will try to get it posted up as quickly as possible. I may include an email to you that, hey, the video is available. So you can go back and view those sections that you're interested in. But I just want to thank my panelists, uh, Ryan, Jacob, Dustin, and Amelia. Did a great job. You answered a lot of questions. And I really appreciate you uh, coming forward to do this because this will pay forward big dividends for a lot of hunters. So thank you. Um, our next topic will probably be chronic wasting disease. I hope to have that on August 26th. Uh, if all things go well, and look forward to a cow tip uh, webinar also. So um, keep watching our social media, our Facebook. That's usually how it's advertised. Uh, if you're not a, um, don't check it out. If you don't have Facebook, I don't have Facebook. But if you uh, check it out, check with our department on upcoming events. Hopefully, those will be posted there. So. Thank you and good night. And thank you everybody on our panel and we will talk to you later. Thanks.